It'll work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Hey, hello, friends. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Dan, and I am doing today Daily Art Adventure number 637, Continuing a Wedding P. In my world, P stands for painting. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> We're now all official and legal. <laughs> uh, so I started this painting uh, this past Sunday. Hello, Susan. Good to see you on board. Thank you for joining me this morning. Well, <laughs> this afternoon, sorry. Might be morning where you are. Um, it was a fun, unusual wedding in a home. Here you see my photograph of the stairway that obviously I'm featuring here. And I have uh, printed off a photograph of the bride and have a picture of the groom. I think this is the first uh, older couple wedding that I've done. So that's particularly fun for, for my portfolio, if you will. Glad to have that in my portfolio. And it's all quite dry, today being Wednesday. That was Sunday. And of course I used Liquin, so it was actually dry two days ago on Monday, but it's quite dry now. Um, let me take these down just for a minute so you can see the whole thing. Late morning, yeah. <laughs> Late morning in California. Yeah, I guess so. Barely. 10.30, right? Um, barely late morning. Um, so here's my painting, and, and I've been walking past it for the last three days uh, in my studio. I'm going, eh, something's not quite right. <laughs> well, first of all, it's way too empty. Um, now here's the funny part. So this is a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of true confessions. I'll put these back up while I talk. <laughs> um, first of all, I am essentially an introvert, and that always surprises a lot of people. What are you? Not an introvert? I am. It's strange. I don't know why I like your company. You would think a, an introvert would want to be left alone. Anyway. <clears throat> Be that as it may, um, <laughs> this room was actually jam-packed with guests. I mean, it was overly crowded. The fire marshal would not have approved had had he been there. But of course, I'm being influenced partly by the photographs. <laughs> Absolutely empty. Anyway, <laughs> so this is an introvert's view of this wedding. <laughs> There's nobody there but me and the bride and the groom. <laughs> So it dawned on me finally, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> I could put a, a lot more stuff in this painting and still, you know, keep them foremost, but have more, it needs more energy. And uh, then I laughed at myself. Um, it reminds me, I've, I've talked about this before, about 10 or 12 years ago, quite a while ago, I spent a week in Manhattan painting. And one day I spent most of the day in Columbus Circle the, US, the USS Maine Memorial entrance to Central Park, very famous spot there in New York City. Easel set up painting. Of course, people were in my way all day long. Thousands, tens of thousands of people went by. <laughs> I came home with my painting. <laughs> it was an introvert's view of New York. There's not a single person <laughs> in the painting. So I thought I had gotten over this impulse. <laughs> But evidently, evidently I have not. <laughs> so I still have to go, oh, wait a minute, there's people in the world. We like people. Yes, we like people. <laughs> so I'm going to add some people. Um, normally, now, and I've, I've mentioned this several times over the years, uh, normally when, when I attack a painting for a second day, the first thing I'll do is glaze the whole thing. But I've decided I'm not going to do that here I'm, because I want to, I don't want to go forward. I'm kind of back up a little bit. So I'm not going to glaze it. I'll do that later, tomorrow, the next day, the day after that. Because there are too many things that I just need to fix uh, in this. Now, uh, <laughs> those pesky people. <laughs> Let me zoom in. Oops, and you know what I better do? Because you know what happens when I zoom. I forget then later on that I'm zoomed, don't I? Okay, so um, 
I am quite happy with my treatment of the bride. So this, this is the way I used to do, and the groom too for that matter, this is the way I used to do um, wedding paintings. The, my, my faces were abstract like that. And frankly, between you and me, there's a big part of me that still prefers that. And I, I have another painting that I did a week ago. I'll put up here just for a minute and show you by contrast by crazy contrast so there's what I'm doing more and more recently and you can watch me finish this you know last week sometime if you want to go back in fact I, I you just posted yesterday a step-by-step -step of of these portraits and I'm quite happy with them and I think my client is these Jeremiah and Selena are going to be quite happy with them <coughs> but as you can see that's quite a bit different from what I'm doing here so more and more, I need to I need to get uh, my clients, bride and groom especially, to tell me which which they prefer. Because truly, some people do prefer the more abstract. Uh, one might even say the more artsy people. I hate, I don't want to go there too quickly or whatever, but there's something to that that, that people who are, have a different art sensitivity, visual sensitivity, visual astuteness visual acuity um, do prefer the more abstract be that as it may I'm going to do abstract in this one and again I'm moving my camera so that you can see what I'm doing okay so I've got again I have the, the photograph right here that's what I'm looking at comparing and I see the first of all this shoulder needs to come in a little so do you see my brush here I'm, I'm getting off onto a new subject already do you see my brush wiggling and jiggling and not exactly doing what it's told you know sort of like out of control so to speak i talked about this uh i don't know in the last couple of days sometime when i was painting that that many uh beginner artists or young or early journey artists, whatever age they are is in material, or early journey, I, I know that they, they tend to get irritated with their hand because, because of that, because of that very wiggly, jiggly, uh, you know, they're, they're, they feel like, they feel like they they can't control their um, brushes, their brushes won't behave their hands won't behave. So because of that, they hike up and do this kind of stuff, tongue painting, I call it. Uh, when in fact, you know, the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. And the essence of interestingness is variety and, and your hand having a mind of its own and doing wiggling and jiggling, so to speak, uh, is in fact probably a good indicator of what interesting marks actually are. Did I pronounce that word actually strongly enough for you? I hope I did. <laughs> One of my Russian viewers commented the other day, left a comment, said he was watching for art and discovered he was learning English. How fun! So I'll have to be, be sure to be careful when I'm butchering, because I butcher the language on purpose often I one of my interests one of my I have no what's the word no cred no credulity no letters behind my name but one of my interests in life is the language of, of art philology the love of language and uh, one of the things I know about language is that it, it advances on the backs of two groups of people. Language does evolve, unless you happen to be Arabic. <laughs> I'll try not to get too whatever about this, but uh, uh, the Arabic, the, the Muslim religion forbids <laughs> language to change. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, I won't go any further down that, lest I sound something. But anyway, language changes on the backs of two people, two, two groups of people. Here they are. Language evolves and changes because of what ignorant people do 
and because of what well-informed edu- people do. So languages changes, language changes, English language, any language that has, is not against the law for it to change. <laughs> it evolves. And it evolves because of the behavior of two groups of people. People who change it on purpose and people who change it, uh, as our kids would say, on accident. That's a good example of language changing. When I was a kid, you always said, by accident. It was always, by accident. You never said, on accident. But our, my children, who are, now in, who are millennials, now in their 30s, they say, on accident. So there you go. So language evolved. Um, And there are two, like I said, two groups of people. This, this has nothing to do with art. This is a reference to my Russian friend who said he was learning English from me. <laughs> so I, I try to be one of the people who changes language on purpose, uh, not one who changes it accidentally. For instance, here's a good example of eventually this word will become a real word, perhaps. If enough people say a word wrongly over and over and over again, if they use it wrongly, it eventually comes to mean what everybody thinks it means. You see, the, the, the dictionary is not an authority on language. A dictionary simply reports uh, how people use the language. So there's two words in the English language, flustered and frustrated. F-R, frustrated and flustered. Flustered. And the two emotions are slightly related. But because of the similarity of pronunciation and spelling, a new word is emerging called flustrated, (laughs) which is not a word at all, officially. But if enough people use it enough times, the dictionary will be obligated to include it. The Oxford Dictionary in 2024, I'm making this up, will be obligated to say, well, what do people mean when they say flustrated? (laughs) Here's, here's a, uh, uh, another example from, uh, for me, a little bit closer to home, having grown up in a very Christian culture. Um, the old King James Bible, translated in 1611, sometimes called the Authorized Version. In the book of Genesis, when it's telling about the creation of Adam and Eve, in Old English, it says, God says, I will make an help meet for him. So in other words, Adam was created, Eve was not yet created, and it's God talking, and he says, I will make an, (laughs) because in Old English, uh, you put a, a, the direct, the direct article, an, not a, we would say a help meet, but in 1611 it was an, and it might be because it was an help, help meet, the H might have been silent, we don't know. Anyway, I will make an, an, an help meet for him. So many people <laughs> coming out of the, if you will, the Bible Belt, the, the King James talking um, part of the Christian church. They didn't understand 1611 English. So they thought that this verse was saying, God says, and I'll put it in modern English, God was saying, I will make a help meet for him. So the word help meet This is so funny. So the word help meet evolved little by little because so many people misunderstood it and used it. You see, what the old English was saying, the word meet, M-E-E-T, when God said, when the Bible says, I will make a, an help meet for him. Meet means appropriate. I will make a, a help that is appropriate, perfectly suited. A help suited to him is what the verse was saying, but people don't, people are ignorant and they don't know Elizabethan English. Imagine that. So instead of 
thinking it's saying, I will make a help suited for him. They, they think it's a word they, well, they actually, they've heard a lot of people say it, a help me. So now the word help me is in fact, yes, in the dictionary, because so many ignorant people mis, misunderstood the word that the, uh, the dictionary was obligated to say, well, here's what help me means. It means a spouse. <laughs> that is hilarious. I am just rambling, folks. I'm just rambling for fun because I enjoy English. It's my podcast. It's not. It's my channel, and I'll, I'll ramble if I want to. You would ramble, too, if it happened to you. <laughs> That's an old song, by the way. You would cry, too, if it happened to you. Boop, bum, 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 bum. So anyway, I want to be part of the crowd that changes language, not out of ignorance, but out of knowledge. Here's one thing I want to change about the English language. Hey, lots of chats. I'm, I'm evidently I'm either irritating or en entertaining a lot of people. One or the other. I'll look in a minute. Um, here's one of the things I want to change. It's not in spoken. It's in written English, and I really do. I would like to, this to change. And it has to do with quotation marks. Here's what I would like. This is what the rule is. All you English majors. So you, you English majors have special issues, problems. <laughs> the philologists among us don't have the same restraints you do. Um, the rule is you put the punctuation inside the quotation mark. For instance, Um, I'm trying to think of it. I make up a sentence. I'm not very good at evidently at making up sentences. There's a conversation going on. Mary calls Bob. A Yankee. Bob, in response, says, I am not a Yankee. And he's putting the word Yankee in quotation marks because he's quoting what Mary just said about him. So in English language, you're supposed to put, I am not a quote-unquote Yankee. Um, you're supposed to put a period and the close quotes, which I think is ridiculous. It should be, I am not a Yankee close quote, and then period. Anyway, never mind, I've lost half of you. Let me see what kind of chat. Susan. <laughs> Uncle Six Steve, your hands shake too much. I hope you're understanding that that's a good thing. Uh-oh. Your stream is good. You're back. Susan, I lost you. I hope it was your end, Susan. I think things are going okay. Hello, KJ. In Arta Pimienta. Oh, from Colombia. Good to have you on board, Arte. Oh, the flower. <laughs> the flower. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Horatio was asking if this down here is part of the painting or part of my house. Oh, boy. That, that requires a little explanation. <laughs> it's actually not a... Um, flower rug. It's actually part of a bedspread. So why is there a bedspread? Am I painting in my bedroom? The answer is no. The answer is somebody is sleeping in my studio. <laughs> some of you, some of you have heard this, this story before. So we have a young lady has been living with us for 10 months. Uh, my wife Boy, this is getting way too... Okay, we're changing the subject here. We're going to talk about something completely different. My wife is amazing. Truly. And in many ways. And one of the ways that she's amazing is she's an amazing healer. <laughs> she is truly gifted at... Um, I'm serious as I can be. Um, she's truly gifted at helping people achieve emotional healing and spiritual freedom, okay? Sounds kind of new age. I'm using new age language just on purpose, just to help you. 
Um, and um, about 10 months ago, a young lady came into her life who, who had a terrible, terrible childhood and is very much in the process of being healed from her terrible childhood. And uh, to make a long, my wife has been tremendous. And this young lady has been living with us for 10 months. <laughs> and that's an air mattress in my studio. <laughs> so Horatio, you open up a whole, shall we say, can of worms with that question. No, it's not part of the painting. It's Charisse's bed. <laughs> the good news is she's pretty good at making her bed. So that, that's, that's a good thing. That would have been a deal breaker if she didn't make her bed, but she does. So I work here in the day and vacated at night. And Cherise comes home and sleeps. She's just about to move out in about two weeks, three weeks at the most. She's going to move out. <laughs> That's not part of the painting. All right, now where were we? We're all over the map. <laughs> uh, I'm making, uh, so far the whole time today, I've been making anatomical corrections uh, on the woman. And I'm, I'm quite happy with these little changes. I've been staring at it for three days and I go, oh, wait a minute, her shoulder needs to be raised up. Just a little bit more. I am not going to finish this painting today for sure because uh, I am doing wet paint. <laughs> that's, that's, that's usually what you do when you paint in oils. So you're painting with wet paint. Woe be to the people that try to paint with dry paint. It doesn't work very well. So I'm painting with wet paint today. And um, that means I can't do my final glaze until after this dries. So I will not be finishing this painting at least until tomorrow because um, I'm going to glaze over the whole thing. All right, I'm, I'm quite happy. made several changes. Um, this shoulder, this arm, breast, uh, uh, front of her arm here, front of her shoulder, a little bit on her profile. Yeah, she looks hot. I like it. <laughs> it's okay for an artist to say that. And... Uh, let me put up the groom for just a minute. Let's do some more, just a few changes on him. I have not looked at him as much as I looked at her. Just That's the way it is with portraits, right? It's all about the bride. The groom is just there as a halfway unimportant prop for the bride. <laughs> I know how weddings work. <laughs> The groom is just there as part of the furniture to show off the bride. <laughs> the front of his jacket needs to come forward a little bit. Here we go. And while I've got this color mixed up, then I'll go ahead and do the front of his sleeve. All right, I think that's good enough, at least for now. Since I'll be finishing this painting tomorrow, of course, then I have the liberty of making further modifications tomorrow if I if I discern the need um, so the difference between a tight realistic painting like the one I showed you I bet a lot of people have just come on that didn't see let me just for fun here's a my previous wedding painting um, looks like this. Can I get that close? Yeah, okay. So there, that's one style, one approach to painting. Much more representational. 
realistic and tight. I do not necessarily consider that to be the better style of painting. In fact, I certainly prefer the style that I'm working on here. And ironically, again, most non-artists would think, oh, that realism stuff, that's hard. Now, it, it is hard. It's plenty hard. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work. I'd be, I'd be crazy to deny it. That realism takes a lot longer. And, um, you know, you burn up a lot of mental juice achieving that degree of realism. You do. You'd be silly to try to pretend otherwise. The difference here with abstract painting is it's, you're burning up <laughs> mental juice doing something different. Um, you, the marks the brush marks themselves are more important, are paramount, are more important. Um, that means with every stroke, you're thinking about the essence and the nature and the feel of the stroke more than you are whether the stroke is achieving perfect realism. So it's a different kind of activity. Um, This kind of painting demands more um, mental presence of mind. You can't let your you can't let your mind drift any time that your brush is on the canvas. You have to be immediately present to the impact that you're creating on the canvas. You can't you can't. Whereas when you're doing realism, you can, in a sense, for half a second, perhaps I could say, you can turn your brain off because you're just rendering, copying something. You don't get that luxury when you're doing abstract realism, which is what I call this technique. I got that term from David LaFell. I think it's L-E-F-E-L, -E -E famous painter. I didn't make it up, but when I heard it years ago, I thought, bingo, perfect description uh, for my style of painting as well as his. Abstract realism. It's obviously realism. That is obvious. But the, uh, the abs all the abstract elements are more important than the realism. Okay, now, this man, Don, the husband here, actually had pale gray trousers on. I'll paint with my thumb for a moment. And since poor Don doesn't get a whole lot of attention in this painting, I want to give at least give him the right colored pants. How about that? All right, now let's let's go back to something a little bit more ticklish, a little bit more fussy, and that is the bride's face. And then as soon as I finish her face, I'm going to start working on the rest of the painting. So again, I'm going to zoom you guys in. Um, those of you who are regulars, um, what happens when I zoom in is I forget then later on to zoom back out. And so I leave you looking at one little bit of my canvas while I go elsewhere. So I've learned my hard lesson, that is don't zoom on the camera. Instead, move the camera. So right now, the camera is right smack dab in my way. In fact, I'm going to put my one arm around one side of the canvas and my other arm around the other side. But I want you to see, I want you to watch this. <sighs> good comments, good chats there. I look forward to seeing those in a bit. Um, now, in order to get this right, I'm going to pull up. There we go. In fact, let me edit this real quickly because I just want to just want to zoom in right on her head her face okay so I'm doing that and then lighten it and then increase the contrast and then decrease saturation 
All right, so that is, that is not a, you know, beautiful um, photograph, the color, because uh, I've manipulated the heck out of it. But it's perfect for my purposes, perfect for um, painting from. Okay, so I'm, here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to, there you go, I'm going to hang up. Hang up my phone, literally. Get rid of this now. I think I'm done with Don. Yahoo. All right. So this is as far as I got the other day. And I didn't want to get any further. Am I zoomed in as far as I can go? Almost. There we go. Well, I didn't want to go any further because I thought, no. I said to, I says to myself, <laughs> that is not proper English. I says to myself, um, if I wait and tackle this, this uh, face uh, until everything else is dry, then I can do this. That is what I'm about to do. Okay, so her face, I'm very happy with it the way it is right now. And I'm not going to mess with it very much. I have dark transparent paint on my brush. I'm going to raise that eyebrow ever so slightly. And the main thing that needs to happen is that right there. Maybe I'm painting with my left hand now. You know what? I am going to grab a Winsor Newton Series 7. That, that's a kind of brush. Well, that's, that's a Robert Simmons. How about that? That is not a Winsor Newton Series 7, but since I mentioned it, let me pull one up and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, as far as I know, the best brush ever made in history. Uh, finest Sable Winsor Newton Series 7. This is a number three. Pretty expensive brush. Best brush ever made. Um, so I always have just a, a special contingent of those. I'm going to shave. Hang on, I've got a, a hair coming off my brush, I think. I'm going to shave just a hundredth of an inch off her nose. That might be good enough. Yeah, this is, I just saw that chat. This is probably the most abstract wedding painting you've seen me do. Um, it's a throwback to the kind I used to do. And frankly, it's, I'm, I'd sort of like to go back in this direction. That's almost perfect. I need to mess up this stroke a little bit. See, I, what I'm doing right now, I, I wouldn't be able to do if, uh, if the uh, underpainting was wet. Now, the next question is, again, with this Winsor Newton Series 7, she has quite, quite a little highlight in the photograph in her eye. Should I try to capture that? And I think that I should. This is not white paint now. Ah, no, that looks horrible. How about the white of her eye? Would that look good? Yeah, that looks all right. Next question, last, last touch up is, do I want to do any flesh colored highlights on her face? And I think that I do right over here, a light stroke. Yeah, I like that, but then soften this, mess up this edge. And how about on her nose? Yep. Yep. But on her cheek? Yep. How about on this cheek? Just a, just a hint. And then, I keep saying just one more thing. 
same brush, more white. She had lovely um, white blonde hair. Is that a, is that a name? And I think it's I think it's hair that is turned white, but she has coiffed. Maybe she used to, she probably used. In fact, I think she is a blonde. I think I remember from years ago. We, we've met before. Oh, here's another. Here's a detail. Here's a little earring action. Here we go. I can do a little bit of sparkle. There we go. That's nice. Aha! There. I like that. Beautiful. Um, again, when an artist says that, he's not bragging, he or she's not bragging. <laughs> I'm as surprised as anyone's like, doggone, how'd that happen? That looks nice. Let me, let me pull this away. And now, back you guys up so you can see the whole painting. Yeah. I, th I think I'm, oh, she looks lovely. And you, you saw a minute ago, let me pick you up again just real briefly. You saw how, how close can I get, how abstract that is. Now, in my opinion, and again, this is not bragging, <laughs> really, honestly, in my opinion, Thank you, Lord. That's a good. That's good painting right there. And and uh, yeah, I'm gonna certainly gonna post this. Same thing with for the groom. I'll show you him again real quickly. Um, it's a matter of opinion, of course. Some people would, you know, want to pay for the for the super tight realistic stuff, and I understand that to each his own. And I'm glad that I'm able to do that other stuff. But frankly, don't tell anybody. Between you and me, I feel like this actually shows the slightly, slightly higher degree of skill than 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 the hyper-realistic stuff. Hyper-realistic stuff takes a lot, a long time. Don't get me wrong; it's not easy, and it takes time. I'm, I don't know if I'm just confusing the heck out of you guys. Some of you. I'm, am I confusing the heck out of the non-artist? That, that may be the case. Here's one of the lessons I've learned lately: is when you use one of these precious Winsor Newton Series Sevens. I'm learning this because I've ruined so many of them. This is uh, uh, the Master's brush cleaner and preserver. Um, for these expensive brushes, go ahead and clean them. Right, right on the spot, and it's it's a preservative. It's like adds oils back into the into the hairs to keep them new. I wish I had done this for years and years and years and years because I've spent a fortune on <laughs> good sable brushes and ruined them way too quickly. All right, Yahoo, the hard part's done. Dang, she looks good. <laughs> I've elongated her just slightly, just slightly, not so anybody would complain. I mean, here, here's the photograph, right? She looks good. I, I, I've given her just a tiny, I mean, this, I do this on all women. Tiny tuck at the waist. That's about all I've done. I've elongated her, her maybe legs just a tiny bit, but not much. And again, that's that's standard operating procedure. I'm I'm, I'm from the John Singer Sargent School of Portrait Painting. Your job is to make people look real, and or slash better than real. Ideal. All right. <laughs> uh, we go all over all over the map around here, don't we? Let me see what some of your comments are. Um. Thanks for all your chats, you guys. Susan, I always think it looks stupid with a period. In I think so, too. Good. Let's, good, Susan. We're starting a movement. <laughs> if, if the person put a period inside their quote, then it should be inside. Otherwise, it should be outside. 
Grandpa looks like he's ready to dance. That's good. That's good. Yeah, no, he's he's definitely Grandpa. He's older than me, I, I believe. I would I would guess he's seventy. He's pretty dapper. And by the way, <laughs> these are shall we say rather prominent business people in town. <laughs> these are. You know, these these are movers and shakers. They own companies, <laughs> big companies. <laughs> anyway, and Lynn, one fifty-two a.m. My goodness, where are you, Lynn? Thank you. Loving this painting so much. Just want to let you know that you inspire me to improve my art every day. I can only dream to reach your skill level. Oh, bless you, Lynn. That is so encouraging. Regarding what you said, oh good, somebody correct me about Muslim friends says Arabic has a lot of variants, especially per region. Just the language of the Quran. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Education here. Bomb, bomb, bomb. Education alert. But Islam doesn't control how the language evolves and changes. Well, that's I've often thought that. They, they can't possibly control it. But anyway, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for that education. I'm always liking getting knowing things that I didn't know before. So I appreciate that very much. Um... <laughs> Susan, holding your breath. <laughs> you need to start broadcasting, Susan, evidently, if you're holding your breath. <laughs> uh, yeah, learn, good. New trick. Take the phone to the canvas. What fun, you guys. Yes, and it's definitely, definitely the most abstract of wedding paintings. And as I said, I think I really would like to move back in this direction. I, if just between you and you and me, <laughs> just between us, friends, when I'm doing, for, here's a piece of paper that, when I'm doing this kind of work, this is that, in the process of that other painting, it, it's hard work, and I always feel like I'm, I'm just, I'm really just schooling myself. I'm really just, not just, I'm also making money and pleasing people and producing nice painting. But on a deeper, higher level, I'm just sharpening skills. I'm just sharpening myself so that I can do this better. Um, you know, if I were able to bring the pendulum back with all the skills that I, with the training, ugh, it's hard work. Anybody that doesn't know portraiture is hard work has never tried portraiture. But I, I would like to bring that back into this. All right. Jabber, 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 jabber. Let's, let's paint. Um, I'm going to uh, work on the railing now a little bit. So uh, it, it is definitely a a contemporary style wrought iron. So it's wrought iron, but it's not like old, you know, gay Paris, gay Paris type wrought iron. It's modern wrought iron. So a lot of straight lines and so on. Um, and again, witness, if you will, you, you, you students, anybody that's a student watching, witness the, pay attention to the, the way that I'm holding my brushes and also, at the moment, um, also painting with my wrong hand uh, and allowing the, the brush to skitter and dance around the canvas um, as opposed to chomping down with the death control grip now, again you understand don't you I'm, I know I'm pulling this up when I paint like this those faces oh no that is that is right-handed painting <laughs> I mean every once in a while I might do my left hand a little bit but no that that is that is death control grip on the brush right so there's a time and a place for that. But if that's not what I call good painting. That's, uh, anyway, it's okay, but no. Nah. Real good painting is painting more the way the human mind sees the world. You know, taking advantage of learning the lessons of the Impressionists about how the human eye actually perceives and so on. And let me hasten to say that here's, this is one of the most ubiquitous rules in all of painting. It is darks first, lights last, right? It, that comes up over and over and over again. 
So anytime I'm painting, anytime you put dark paint on the canvas, which by the way is almost always, almost always transparent paint. All right, there's another, that's the Dan Nelson rule. You won't get that everywhere. You'll get that from painters who are uh, painting uh, beautiful paintings in the tradition of all the great painters who painted for 500 years before 1890. For the 500 years before 1890, everybody knew this rule. You get dark with transparent, light with opaques. Um, anyway, anytime you're painting dark, I was starting to say, that means that's just the wind up. That's just the, you're just setting up the, the, the follow through to um, any dark marks, of course, is light marks. So when I'm doing all this dark stuff, that means I'm going to come back and paint light marks um, close to, adjacent to, or on top of these dark marks. Does it make sense? The so dark is always the wind up. Now, by the way, since I just did some portraiture, some portrait work here, um, the, the, one of the biggest exceptions to this rule, the rule of um, you get what you get dark with transparent color. One of the biggest exceptions to that in my book, in my opinion, is in fact in portraiture. Uh, you are, so to speak, you're allowed to use opaque colors on, on faces to, to get dark on, on faces because Otherwise, the, the contrast that you uh, put onto a face can be easily become too intense, too great uh, if you use transparent. So anyway, I, I know I'm, I'm getting too deep for some of you. Forgive me. But let's just go back to back to the subject of darks first, lights last. get too close to the groom's face there. Yeah, evidently I'm changing my mind about where that, that these stairs go. That's all right. Let me, let me continue to talk about darks first, lights last. Um, a closely related subject. Um, The human eye is inexorably drawn to punctiliar light. <laughs> I like to say some, sometimes I like to say things with big words because it's a mnemonic device. It helps you remember things. If I just said, people like to see points of light, you go, uh-huh. But if I say it kind of weird, <laughs> like, the human eye is inexorably drawn to punctiliar light. You go, what? <laughs> and then I'm going to explain it to you, and you're more likely to remember it. At least that's my theory, okay? So it's the teacher in me sometimes that makes me use big words. I am not of the mindset, as some people are, that you should always put the cookies on the bottom shelf. That's another story. I'll try not to get into it now. Sometimes I think you should use big words so that people get smarter, including yourself. Um, all right, so human being, the human eye, and I believe, I believe this is innate and natural. It's either part of our, uh, it's either part of our evolutionary journey or evolution has succeeded in creating creatures who are this way so that they have a leg up in future evolution or it's part of our eternal, uh, God-given or divine 
Nature. There you go. I've offended everybody and hopefully nobody. There, right? Um, the human eye is inexorably. That means you can't help it. That means you, you have no choice in the matter. It's not a matter of opinion. And I'm saying that all human eyes are drawn to punctiliar light. What that means. Points of light. So I just, maybe I've just finished the railing, at least for the moment. I'm going to clean these brushes. And then I'm going to show you why I'm talking about that. Why is he talking about <laughs> the human eye inexorably drawn to punctiliar light? That is to say, people like dots of light. <laughs> okay. Why don't you just say that the first time? Well, because then you wouldn't remember it. I've already been through that. So, so now that I've done dark stuff, the dark railing, that sets me up for the follow through. So now, same brushes. I'm going to mix up pale, light, yellow, tan. Whatever you want to call it. I don't have a name for these. You know, we don't have names for these colors. It's just a mixture of stuff. And you see how there's the, the stair treads are dark. I just painted those. And the railing is dark. So in between, that's too bright. Hang on. In between the stair steps and in between and around and behind, all of this dark stuff is, here's the photograph, right? Here's all the light stuff poking through. Now, I am serious as I can be about this. This is one of the things that way too many painters don't get. So I'm, I'm hoping you're getting it. All of that dark stuff that I just painted a few minutes ago, I'm going to be f funny. It's nothing but a flimsy excuse. <laughs> I'm being facetious again for teaching purposes. It's nothing but a flimsy excuse for punctilier light. It's nothing but a flimsy excuse for points of light. What I'm doing now is what the human eye likes to see. Does that make sense? So in your paintings, all of y'all's paintings, <laughs> in your paintings, you should be constantly on the lookout for excuses, thinly veiled excuses for creating points of light. Did you get that? Let me say that again. In all of your painting, you should be constantly on the lookout. Do you see how that little, that's coming alive right there? Our eyes, let me say it again, the human eye can't help itself. It is inexorably attracted to punctiliar light. Can't even help it. You cannot, re I know that this is true of everybody who's going to ever look at any of my paintings, that they like dots of light. Well, don't they like dots of, I think people like dots of dark. Well, you're an idiot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're wrong. No, no. People do not like darts, dots of darkness. <laughs> they like dots of light. Now, listen, if, if you are Richard Schmidt and you're watching this, or if you're Kevin McPherson or you're Daniel Green or you're some big, way, 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 way better artist than me, then I'm, I know I'm being a little bit something here. Please feel free to correct me. Um, but nah, I'm correct. I'm I, 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 I'm right about this. <laughs> How do I know I'm right? And eh, never mind. I don't know. It's a gift. I don't know, or a curse, one or the other. I have a gift for not only knowing how to paint, but understanding painting. That, that's all I'm going to say about that. Some of you have it. Some of you don't. That's all right. You don't need it. If you have knowledge, that can be can be good enough. All right, but are you getting, are you seeing this? We like points of light. Now, it's going to go somewhere else with that just a minute ago. Let me think about it for a minute. Where was I going next? Oh, yes. Okay. So, let me repeat. 
bottom line that I said just a few minutes ago, in all of your painting, at every point in your painting process, you should be looking for excuses for inserting points of light. Now, you might say, well, can't you overdo it? Of course, of course, of course. You can overdo everything. Everything can be overdone. Of course. So, but that's not what we're talking about at the moment. We're talking about understanding the principle, not about overdoing the principle. Okay? Most people need to learn the principle first. So can you have too many dots? Oh, yes. In fact, we have a term for that on my channel. It's called, it's called dotification. <laughs> I think Toby. Toby, if you hear this. Oh, was it Tony? I think it's Toby. I'm sorry, all of a sudden I'm drawing a blank. I think it was Toby who came up in you know, a year ago, two years ago, with dotification or the more fuller term, over dotification. And whenever you have over dotification, do you know what you need to do, do then? You need to employ anti dotification. <laughs> and yes, these are <laughs> these are all terms we have <laughs> we have coined. <laughs> In this, on, on my channel. Anti-dotification. That is when you have too many dots, you need to come in and anti-dot. <laughs> okay, so of course anything can be overdone. Of course, of course. Now, a corollary to that, to the dotification principle. <laughs> no, a corollary to the um, punctiliar light principle. Corollary to that. Not only when you're painting, now see, if as long as I don't overdo it, this, this, I'm going to zoom in just for a second. This, ladies and gentlemen, is charming. Need to be careful not to overdo it. Um, corollary to that. Besides, I'm going to mix, make this darker again. Besides looking for excuses to create points of light, punctiliar light, besides looking, always looking for an excuse to create punctiliar light, here's what else you should be doing. This is a, a corollary to that. You should always be looking for an excuse to negative paint. That is to what I'm doing right now. In a sense, you could say I'm painting the railing, right? But not by painting the railing, but by negative painting, by painting what's behind the railing. The human eye, let's just keep using the same terminology. The human eye is inexorably drawn to things that are painted in the negative. Wow. Now, you should be saying, what? I've never heard that before. I know, that's why you're watching this channel. Um, let me say it again. The human eye, let's just keep using that big word. The human eye is inexorably, that means you can't help yourself, inexorably drawn to things painted in the negative. That means instead of painting the object, you're painting stuff around the object in order to define the object. Right? Does that make sense? And again, you should be saying, uh-uh, <laughs> some variation thereof, or say, uh-uh, explain that. Why? I will. I'm going to explain it right now. Why does the human eye get a kick out of seeing stuff negative painted like this railing. Now, by the way, everything I'm talking about right now is the, the tree holes. Uh, again, what most people call sky holes. Tree holes are a classic example of this. Why do we get a kick out of tree holes? But you see, this is like tree holes, right? Because the railing's up front and the light's behind it. Let me explain then why, why paint things in the negative. Here's why. Because everybody knows, that looks at this painting, everybody knows that there's a some kind of metal railing on the stairs. Duh, right? Everybody knows. You can say, oh yeah, I, I see there's a railing. Everybody knows that the wall and the stairs are behind, further away from us, and the railing is up close. Are you with me so far? 
check. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows the, the light stuff is back there. The dark stuff is up here. Check. Therefore, any time that you paint in the reverse of that, that is to say, with close examination, your eye can tell that these light bits were painted on top of the dark bits. So let me go back and review. This is a principle you must know as a painter. That anytime you can paint in the reverse, especially if it's a dark light like this, do it. Why? Because we know from our walking around this planet, we know the dark railing is up close and the light stairs and wall are far away. But when it's painted so that the light paint is closer to us than the dark paint, because it was put on top. Do you understand? There was dark paint up put light on top. It creates a little split second wiggle of confusion, I like to call it. It creates just a momentary like in your brain. It's like, what's going on here? Because it's the opposite of what I expect. Here's what the brain, here's what the boring painter, painter and the boring painting does. Here's, let me tell you, here's what the boring painter and the boring painting does. It paints the wall and the stairs, light colors. Then it comes with dark paint and paints dark on top of the stairs. When you do it that way, the brain does not enjoy this little second of confusion. Now, that, see, that's the key concept. The, the brain, the human brain, <laughs> again, to use this pompous language, and I'm doing it on purpose because I, 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 I'm trying to close off an escape. And some of you say, well, that's your opinion. Well, no, no, it's not just my opinion. This is the way it is. <laughs> and it's my opinion that this is the way it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and some of you are going to say, man, this guy is so arrogant. If that's the way you feel, then this channel is not for you, my friend. And... Uh, Frankly, I'm going to be arrogant for a second and say, show me your paintings. And if you're way better than I am, then I will listen to you. Boy, I'm sorry for to be so blunt. You wouldn't believe how many lousy painters <laughs> take it upon themselves to correct me. It's, it's sad. Anyway, it's sad. Anyway, um, so it is, it is the confusion that releases joy juice in the viewer's brain. It, and that's counterintuitive. There's so much about visual art that is counterintuitive. We enjoy being confused for a second about what's in front of what. Okay? So that's the bottom line. We, in, at least in this, down this tangent, we enjoy being confused about what's in front of what. And then very quickly, our brains can resolve and say, oh, I get it. The dark railing's in front, but he painted the light paint on front. And, Whoa, that's cool. That's kind of what our brain does in, in one second. Okay? So I've given you two things. Always be on the lookout for an excuse to create points of light. And that's what I've done right there. Number two, always be on the lookout for an excuse to paint in the reverse. Paint what's in front first and then paint what's behind on top of it so we get that confusion. All right. I wish somebody had taught me that 40 years ago because I swear I would have paid attention. They didn't, but I'm teaching you and uh, you can take it and benefit from it at an earlier age and stage than I have done. Okay, I need to do um, a little bit of the, the wall up here. Same principle, painting the wall after I've painted the railing. The, the wall is behind the railing, but I'm painting the walls on top of the railing. Another Another way to say uh, uh, everything that I've just been saying, another corollary, another way to say it is the human eye enjoys seeing light paint on top of dark paint. The human eye, now this does not refer to watercolor at all. Watercolor is a completely different animal and I know what I'm talking about. I've actually done, forgive me for sounding again defensive, but I've done more years of watercolor painting than I have. I did 30 years of watercolor, 15 years of oil. So. I'm not un, un, unfamiliar with the dynamics of watercolor, but this does not apply to watercolor. Having said that, let me say it again. Um, the human eye gets a kick out of seeing light paint on top of dark paint. The opposite is not true. We do not like 
is the simplest, dumbest way to put it. We do not like seeing light paint on top of dark paint. No, no, we do not like seeing dark paint on top of light paint. We do like seeing light paint on top of dark paint. There. Good enough? I'm probably painting too much with my right hand here, aren't I? Um, okay, I think, I think I can, I think I'm ready to now do a little bit more light around the woman against this, on, on this wall behind her, yeah. Okay, I'm going to bring you in real close just for a minute here. I want you to see. Now this, now I've said this, I just, I talked about this the day before yesterday, whatever broadcast, on my painting that's in the garage right now. now this is a Dan Nelsonism. You can see there's a, a random abstract pencil mark that goes that way and that way. And there's another one up here. It's even more recent, but you can still see those marks. Um, I can almost say with honesty, I don't know why I do those. It's almost. But I, I do know why I do them. The answer is because I think they're going to make the painting better, more interesting, one could say more beautiful. What I'm doing right now is a, a Dan Nelsonism. You're welcome to try it. You don't have to. But I, I find myself doing this often. And that is, you understand that these, the, the, I am not indicating that there were cracks in this woman, this is her house. I'm not indicating that there were cracks in this woman's wall. Do you understand? The, the, these lines have nothing to do with realism. They are purely abstract. So, because they don't reflect reality, it would be logical to cover them up, erase them, so to speak. That would be a logical impulse. Are you with me? Does that make sense? It makes sense to cover them up because they're not there. But in fact, I'm going, I am doing the very opposite of covering them up. I'm actually re-accentuating them, re-emphasizing them by this little trick of painting with opaque paint, painting up to the edges of it, top and bottom. And why am I doing that? Well, again, why do I do anything? Because I think it's gonna make it a better painting. I think I have, I'm gonna back you up. I think I have some understanding uh, about why I do that, um, and I, because first of all, I think it looks cool. Then, then after that, I try to analyze it and say, "Yeah, but why does it look cool?" And I'm going to try to answer that for you right now. I'm doing it, again, same thing with this pencil mark up here, and I do it not only with pencil marks, but there's a there's likewise. You see, I don't know if you can still see. I think you can. Yeah, this abstract greenish blue stroke right there again has absolutely nothing to do with realism logic would say the realist artist in me would say well cover it up it's not it's a mistake it does, it's not real that's ridiculous what are you trying to indicate with that is it a crack in a wall is it cobwebs coming down from the ceiling what are you doing it shouldn't be there you, I'm sure you hear me yeah I'm, I'm I'm, I'm saying to that voice, you are such a non-artist. You're not visual. You don't, you're, not, you're thinking with your left analytical brain. You're not thinking with your eyeballs because your eyeballs go, I don't know what the heck that is, but dang, does it look cool. <laughs> okay, that's what your eyeballs are saying. Um, here's, uh, again, my attempt to try to explain some. What, what, 
hang on just a minute, by the way. I, I need to lower this. I want to lower this canvas down a little bit. It's a little bit hard to reach up there. Um, another way to say uh, the same thing, or almost the same thing. Um, a few minutes ago, when it was um, just so to speak, a bare naked pencil line going across the wall right there. The pencil line could have been construed. By the way, let me while I'm while I'm doing it, that doesn't mean I can't come in here and cover up part of that line. In fact, usually I do. There, okay. So I've covered up. But what it was just a pencil line. I'm trying to I'm trying to play uh, armchair shrink here, armchair psychologist. Here, here, I think that the viewer's mind, brain, mind, can go, huh, that looks kind of like a mistake. I wonder if he meant to do that, Mark. Are you with me? But then, when I come and paint up to it, thereby not only not hiding it, which would be in the correct thing to do, the realist in my brain goes, that's stupid, cover that up, that's not realistic. That's, that is not a good artist in my brain talking, that's a that's, uh, obsessive, compulsive, left brain analytical voice talking, not, not, a, not a good artist voice talking. Um, but when I have painted up to it. Not only have I not obliterated, now I've told the audience, so to speak, I'm calling the viewers, now I'm calling the viewers audience. I have told the audience that not only did I put that pencil mark there, but I did it on purpose. It's obvious that it's not a mistake. It's like, man, he actually worked. <laughs> when you look at these two marks now, you actually go, that's ridiculous. I don't know what that is, but he put it there on purpose. And here's what I think happens, at least to some degree, in the viewer's mind. First of all, they relax because they don't get the feeling that they're looking at a mistake. Okay? People don't like to look at mistakes. I'm, I'm not entering the world of 20th century propagandistic ugly art now, okay? I'm, I'm just staying in the world of beautiful art. People don't like the, to get the feeling like they're looking at mistakes. Are you with me? So anytime they feel like they're looking at a mistake, they go, ugh. I'm not sure they meant to do this. But having done this, they go, okay, well, it's not a mistake. And then maybe the next thing they think, and I, I'm not saying people are thinking this consciously. It's not my job to make people process all of this consciously. It's my job to affect them unconsciously whether they know what's going on or not. The second thing they think is, well, they, he obviously did it on purpose. Huh. And then, in a sense, if I can, let me act this out a little bit. Once they see that I did that on purpose, then here's what I think they do and here's what I want them to go. Oh. Huh. I kind of like it. If they can get into the right, not the left, analytical, linguistic, obsessive, compulsive side of their brain, but the free-spirited, visual side, right side of their brain, the right side of the brain goes, yeah, we like it. We, over here, we like it, we like it, we like it. <laughs> Left brain's going, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay? But if they know I did it on purpose, and the left brain goes, okay, he did it on purpose, and the right, right, that right side of the brain goes, yay, we like it. <laughs> Forgive my theatrics. But I sort of think that's what's going on. Can't prove it, but I think that's what's going on. Fair enough? <laughs> uh, if nothing else, I entertain myself. Hey, sweetie. I am. Should I, I could take a break. Want me to come down? Sure. Okay. I'll, ta I'll take a break in a minute and come down. Ah, <sighs> this is a good place to stop. So um, I have to do the, fl there's flowers on this banister. Can you see that? Pink, blue, yellow, white, and ribbons hanging down. So I, I want to indicate that. 
And then once that's done, the, then the real core of the painting will be done. I'm going to then come in and add people. And that will be done, of course, in layers, starting, of course, with dark layers, and then, then proceeding to lighter and lighter layers. Right? My beautiful wife just came home and wishes to have a word with me. I wish to have a word with her, too. I'm, I'm being... That sounds bad. I didn't mean it. That, I'm serious. I'm literal. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take a little break. When I come back, we do flowers and ribbons and then do crowds of people. That'll be fun. You know what? You know what? I should do a separate broadcast because I can call it abstracting figures in your painting. That's a good idea. Thanks for helping me with that. So let me look at your chats here just for a minute before I wrap up. So I will, I'll do a separate broadcast. Hope, hope people won't be, um, won't be too bad. Lynn, brush care, yeah. Hello, Lynn A. from the Philippines. What fun. What fun. Good to have you on board. Um, it would have been nice, <laughs> Susan, you're exactly right. Would have been nice if there'd been a painting on that wall. <laughs> Good point. Uh, I could add one. I won't. Thank you. Good point. Um, and yes, I will post. I try to post all these in the community section. Uh, Uncle 60, whatever happened to the marina painting, I'm going to finish that next, a week from today. So um, at a party. So I am going to, um, I'm going to um, proceed pr probably tomorrow, certainly by Monday. Thanks for asking. Thanks for remembering. Uh, and David says, the second step from the bottom is not the same as the third. Let me go. Second, third. Needs a little bit of correction. Oh, the, the, the riser is off. Thank you. <laughs> David's always good at getting me little, giving me little things. So that means what he's saying is that, I don't know if I can do it. No. Let me try to do something really, really quick here. He's saying that the, uh, and then the question is, I th yeah, I think I need to, I need to raise up this step right here. Thanks, David. <laughs> David is my, what, good conscience, evil conscience, uh, techie voice, correct voice. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. I might have caught that. Might not. So thanks. Um, Uncle says, if you need to add light, you usually already have dark and vice versa. I tend to go overboard on dark and then say darn. <laughs> we all have that experience. I agree. Marlene, good to have you, my dear. Thanks for your talk today. This reminds me of one of my favorite books, Art and Physics by Leonard Schlein. I'll have to look that up. Marlene, thank you. Um, hey, Mark Toomey. Nice, always nice to have you on board. <laughs> David says, you're nuts. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> um, how you handle dark and blind blows my mind, Lynn says in the Philippines. Thank you for your awesome, always sharing your work with us. You're all, you're certainly welcome. Yes, they should buy my big, yeah, they should buy, <laughs> that's right, they're rich enough. They should buy one of my big paintings to go on that empty wall. There's an idea. <laughs> I'll say, hey, uh, hey, um, Linda, uh, <laughs> as a wedding gift, I'd like you to buy this painting from me. All right, so it's, been a, it's been a productive hour, however long it's been here. How long have I been doing this? Um, whatever, hour and a half. Um, Happy with her, happy with the railing, happy with the wall behind her. So when I come back, flowers and then people. But I think I'll focus on the people. All right. Thanks, you guys, for watching. Great fun. Appreciate it all the time. Thanks for your comments. Bye-bye.